proposing yet more cuts to courses and staffing. La Trobe University has this week announced that for anyone to be on campus from December, they need to be fully vaccinated. Could ensuring that universities provide COVID safe environments be a potential selling point for an industry that has been abandoned by federal government? Thank you. My name's Natasha Joyce. I'm from Bendigo in Victoria. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Natasha. What a lovely message. <laughs> and, and Brian, I'll, I'll go to you on that. Where are you at at the moment on getting students back and having the right protocols and protections? Yeah, well, of course, we're in lockdown here in Canberra, and uh, I don't see that uh, changing for the rest of the semester. We have five weeks left. So we're surely trying to get our head around 2022. Of course, it's quite an uh, interesting vi uh, environment where I don't think anyone really knows for sure. But we're going through systematically looking at, for example, air quality in our classrooms, in our buildings, trying to assess this, because there really hasn't been a lot of regulation there. And there's a trade-off. Normally, if you vent uh, air into buildings, uh, they become less energy efficient, for example. So there's filters and things that are new technology we're going to have to look at. With respect to vaccination, uh, we need to make sure that the environment we provide on our campus is safe. It's not really, you know, it's not, it has to be safe to a, a standard. What, so does that, think what, what, what does that mean, though, Brian, if I could just come in there? Um, does that mean that you're going to... I mean, are, are your staff going to be... Uh, is it going to be mandatory for them to be vaccinated? Are you going to have to have critical levels of vaccination before you can open up to having certain numbers of students back? Where are you at in really benchmarking this? Yeah, I mean, it looks to me that we will be over 95% vaccinated both within our staff and within our students, and we're going to be embedded in Canberra which is well on its way of also achieving over 95%. So at that point, uh, the modeling I have seen, but we need to keep on working on this as we understand uh, what's going on, indicates that requiring vaccination is not as important as probably other interventions we can do. But we're not going to be able to just have a wide open campus, it looks like, for the foreseeable future. We're going to have to have interventions with respect to air quality, masks, probably limits within rooms. Uh, and we're in the process of trying to understand exactly through the modeling, through our understanding of how this disease is progressing other ways, how we're going to run the campus next year. And that, 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 sounds, that sounds very open-ended, Brian. Um, it uh, is. So, so is this going to be more online teaching into next year? That changes the experience yeah. for, for the student? Are you looking at being in the middle of next year, towards the end of next year? It just seems to be a very open-ended process. Well, my, my hope is, Stan, that we will have our campus open to staff and to students uh, next year uh, at the beginning of term. But we have to be honest that we uh, don't completely understand how this disease is evolving. Uh, and there are going to be some restrictions. So m my belief is we will be able to have uh, you know, classes largely on campus. There might be restrictions to class size. Uh, there may be requirement for vaccination mm. in certain uh, situations where the health says we need to have it, uh, but we cannot put people at risk. And it's an evolving situation. We can see we're learning as we go. And so absolutely, my intent is to have the, the, the campus open, but I don't think it will be absolutely like it was in 2019, I'm afraid. Mm. I want to bring Kirsten Banks, who's just joined us now. And Kirsten, that changes the nature of the experience, as I said, for both the student, for people working in the university as well. Um, what should we be looking at as we open up? The levels of exposure, the levels of risk, questions of ventilation, where do you sit on this? Look, I think the thing we need to keep in the forefront of our minds is to keep people safe. And keeping safe is keeping on top of things like exposure sites, making sure that people are vaccinated so that transmission is let down to a minimum. And look, I've been doing my PhD from home for half of the time I've been doing my PhD. Mm. I am really keen to get back into the <laughs> university. Uh, luckily, I'm in a field where I'm very privileged to be able to do that from home. As long as I have my laptop and a stable internet connection, I can do my research from home. But for many other researchers, that's been a very difficult time throughout these times where you cannot go to the universities. They're shut down. They're completely mm. locked from people going and doing what they need to do to advance our knowledge 
knowledge and science. Vanessa's agreeing with that furiously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I work on whales as one of my primary species, and so it's li limited how you can get out to the ocean. We have to mm. think about how we do things. People working in the laboratory, they have to change their whole way in which they make, make you know, assessments on certain bacterial cultures, that kind of thing. It changes a lot of things and I feel really privileged to and very fortunate and I feel sorry for this next generation coming through in the PhD world right now. It's tricky because you don't have that face to face but also you can't go to international conferences and the good thing is we've been able to adapt and I think we need to look at the positives and adapting in this climate. We see parents teaching their children at home and I'm sure a lot of teacher, parents rather are appreciative of their teachers right now. We're living in different times but we're, be, we're adapting to it and this is a good thing. We need to look at the positives. Yes, there are challenges and I really do feel for those students going through these challenges but out of this, we're, we're able to talk to each other in, remotely right now. People are watching us on devices in different parts of the world but safe mm. and this is the main thing forward. So there's, there's some positives that come out of a bad situation. But we haven't addressed the other part of the question which is how the universities have been abandoned. Mm. The, there was a recent study that said to May last this year, 40,000 jobs, one fifth of the workforce have, have gone because universities were denied job keeper, job seeker. That is something that we really have to worry about. Uh, universities are going to be driving the innovation that gets us out of, the, out of this pandemic. The, they've been developing the vaccines. Um, what does that say to, about this country that we have? There, there was a billion, there was a billion dollars in research um, uh, program support. Was that not enough? It's not enough because you know, all the overseas students were unable to come. 40,000 jobs disappeared. To put that in context, uh, the coal industry, which we do seem to support, or politicians seem to support, employs 39,000 people. So that's more than the coal industry has disappeared. And that's that's a, a, a generational loss. It, it does raise the question too, Michael, and this has been raised before, that whether there was much reliance on money from overseas, to, which would ultimately go through to funding this, was as part of the model was there too much reliance on overseas students and overseas funding? Yeah, I, I have to say, so I'm, a, I'm an academic too, right, at the University of Sydney. I, I absolutely despise this question, right? Universities, not, not you, Stan, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be despised. <laughs> universities, like any other organization, respond to incentives, right? And they follow the pathways that are open to them. The government regulates universities in Australia. It's not like the US system where there are these private institutions that can, within some bounds, do have quite a lot of latitude. It's not the same here. You can't just raise fees uh, on your own. You can't just change student numbers on your own. Because of that, universities were forced into a circumstance where all the research funding was getting tighter and tighter. Uh, all these things called research infrastructure block grants that come on top of grants, they were all getting cut and cut and cut. And so what is the one lever that universities were left with it was undergraduate enrollments. And so they followed the incentives. They acted like good businesses, just like the government always asks for. And, you know, yes, something catastrophic has happened uh, to the market. But I mean, I, I wanted actually to come back to, to Brian's point earlier, and maybe I'll give you a, a little bit of a, a pointed response. We, yes, we talked about safety, and yes, we as academics want a safe work environment. We also want the institutions for which we work to speak up as leaders. So even though vaccination as a, as a mandate may not change things based on a 95% level and the amount of uh, other non-pharmaceutical interventions that are available, why not come out and say, as a scientifically driven, fact-based organization, we believe that vaccines are essential, except for those who have immunocompromised circumstances mm -hmm. and the like, right? Let's be leaders instead of always running and being afraid of, uh, of the politicians. Brian, just a quick response to that. Yeah, absolutely. Every time I talk to my staff, I say, get vaccinated. Mm. And uh, the question is, do I tell them because it's the right thing we'll to mandate do? mandate it. Or do I mandate it? And uh, that's, that's a really interesting, hard question. I'm going to try to get to the 99% level without mandating. And if I need to mandate, I will for health and safety reasons. Would you say mandate, Michael? I say mandate because it sends a message, not because I think people won't listen.